Esther chapter 7. That's where we are. Speaking of government overreach, right? The Persians want all the Jews dead. And they've issued an edict to kill them all, right? That's right where we left off. Esther chapter 7, right in the middle of Esther, Queen Esther, attempting to save her people. Right? Second in command is Haman. He's issued an edict that all the Jews be annihilated solely because he hated Mordecai, who he finds out is a Jew. It wasn't enough for Haman that he maybe poison Mordecai or have him assassinated. He hates the idea that Mordecai won't bow to him so much that how can I hurt him even more? I will kill him and I will wipe out every one of the, his people, every one of them. All the while, though, he has no clue that Esther, Queen Esther, is herself a Jew. And so it looks hopeless for the people of God, right? But yet, as we saw last week, the tide is starting to turn. There's hope. Esther has the king's ear. More importantly, Esther has God's favor. Haman now is reeling because he's having this gallows built for Mordecai. And we understand gallows to be hung from, but the gallows they're referring to is they would impale you on a stake and have your body hung out and displayed for everyone to see. And he's having these gallows built for Mordecai, 75 feet tall. They'll impale Mordecai and they'll display his body for everyone to see in Susa. And so he comes early in the morning to ask the king for permission. Hey, king, I want to kill him. Can I kill him? Let me do it. Can I? He's the second in command in all of Persia. The king should say yes, okay? But at that same moment we were talking about last week, by the providence of God, the king is reminded that Mordecai thwarted an assassination attempt years earlier. The king had insomnia. He asked for the records to be read. And in that just ordinary reading of the records, he's reminded that Mordecai's a hero and that Mordecai saved his life. So the king, so, so, and he finds out he's never rewarded. So as Haman's coming in to ask the king to kill Mordecai, the king sees Haman and he says, Hey, Haman, theoretically, what would you do to honor somebody who deserves honor? What would you do to bless them? And Haman is certain that the king is talking about him because Haman is all about himself. And why wouldn't everybody be talking about him? So Haman gives off his wish list. Well, king, what I would do is I would dress him in your royal robes. I would put him on your royal horse. I would take somebody powerful in the kingdom, have them lead the horse throughout the city, and proclaim the greatness of this man and this rider. The king loves it. But to Haman's horror, the king wants to honor Mordecai. Okay, Haman, go dress Mordecai in these royal robes. Lead him on this royal horse. Proclaim. You proclaim his greatness throughout the city. And this nearly breaks Haman. One day earlier, he was proclaiming his greatness to his wife and his kids. And, and, and then this happens, right? And immediately following having to do what would be the worst thing in his life to do, he runs home to his wife, we're told, in total collapse. And after she hears all that happens there at the end of chapter 6, Oh, that happened? Oh, and Mordecai's a Jew? Like, we know stories about the Jewish people and how their gods preserve them and the God they serve. His wife says, oh, you're going to die. Like, this is it. Like, you're going to die. And as she's still uttering those words, the king's men arrive to take Haman away for the second of these feasts that Esther's throwing. That's chapter 7, verse 1. Look at it. So the king and Haman, they went into this feast. This is the second one with Queen Esther. And on the second day as they were drinking wine, after the feast, the king again said to Esther, what is your wish, Queen Esther? It will be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. So this is the second feast by, uh, by Esther in as many days. This is a feast in honor of Haman, in honor of King Xerxes. Well, we were at, talking about this last week. Why is Esther being so elusive? She approaches the king at the throne, right, at great, you know, risk to her life. And the king says, what is it that you want? Even to half the kingdom, I'll give it to you. And she says, I'll tell you later, just come to a feast. They have that feast. At that feast, the king says the same thing. What is it you want? I'll give it to you, even to half the kingdom. It's an idiom. It means, I'll be generous, I promise. He's saying this publicly. Everybody's hearing the king's stance towards the queen. And at that feast, she says, what I want is one more feast. And at this next feast, I'll tell you what I want, right? So she asks him to come to this feast, and this is what happens. And he promises all of these things. And 
She asks if she can throw this, this next feast that we're reading about now. Well, what is this? This is meekness by Esther. This is wise calculation on her part. Well, why does she have to be wise about this? Why does she have to be calculating about the situation? Because she's about to ask the king to reverse a law that's irreversible. This has the ability to look poorly on the king, right? Second of all, if he grants the request, right, Persia is going to lose the entire country, the entire empire is going to lose half of its tax revenue for the year. Haman promises that if the king allows him to wipe out this people, he'll take the spoils, and the amount of the spoils, they estimate, will be what would be about 10,000 talents or half a year of revenue for the empire. So Esther has got to get the king to reverse an irreversible edict. She's got to get him, if he does this, he's going to lose half a year's tax income, right? Third, in doing so, she's going to reveal her identity. She's going to reveal that she herself is a Jew, and this places her squarely in the sights of Haman, who wants all Jews killed. Fourth, she has to accuse Haman while not accusing the king. I mean, that's a delicate road, right? The king signed off on this decree. He sealed this decree with his own ring. That's why she's pretty sure she's going to die. How is she going to thread the needle and take care of all of those things? It's nearly an impossible mission. That's why she's calculating. That's why she's so careful. Her wisdom, though, her tact, the hand of God, the people fasting, it's all evident as she proceeds. So at the second feast, the king asks again, repeating for the third time how generous he will be. I will give up to half my kingdom. There's nothing I won't do for you, my queen. This is a public statement that everyone hears. The king is on record saying, I will be generous. I will grant this request three times. Esther senses that now is the time. Look at verse 3. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. The loss there, she's talking about the loss of revenue. So notice how Esther in her wisdom doesn't accuse the king, right? She uses the passive voice. What's, what's your request, my queen? My request, king, is that we've been sold to be destroyed and killed and annihilated. She is not pointing fingers yet. And if it were merely into slavery, I would remain silent. By speaking in such a way, right, the king's anger is raised without pointing fingers, the king's blood pressure and his anger are raised, but yet nobody's been accused. And if I have found favor, king, would the king intervene on my behalf for myself and my people? This appeal works. The king is enraged. He loves his queen. Who threatens her life? Who would dishonor the king in such a way by threatening the life of the queen? And can I just stop with a side note here? Just let me stop just for a second. You remember in chapter 1 when Queen Vashti, who Esther ultimately replaced, she refused to come when summoned. That started a giant problem in the empire of Persia. The king can't even control his own wife. This put Persian rulers into a frenzy to the point where they created an edict that wives were all wives throughout the kingdom were to listen to their husbands and do what they're told. That was their edict in chapter 1. To the outside observer... These people, Haman and Xerxes, who considered himself a god and was considered as a god by many others at the time. To the outside observer, these are men's men. But that's not the case when the curtain's pulled back. The Bible pulls the curtain back on them. In fact, they're quite insecure men. They're easily manipulated. Repeatedly, the book of Esther highlights how the women are leading because the men fail to. But Jason, the Bible oppresses women. It holds them down. It silences them. To quote the great Dwight Schrute, false, okay? All right? False. Now, you've had two great quotes today from Aristotle and Dwight Schrute. You can't get a better diversity than that, okay? Subtly, but clearly, you see the Bible is highlighting the impact of strong women. Poorly in the case of Haman and his wife. 
Because instead of calming Haman down and helping him get, hey, Haman, why are you freaking out over one dude? You're the second in command of all of Persia. And so she's like, oh, you ought to try and kill him. That's what you ought to do. And ultimately, her advice is going to get Haman killed. But you see it also then positively in the case of Esther, who saves her people through her courage, through her wisdom, through her grace. It's all over the pages of Esther. All right? Now, back to the text. Interest is peaked. The blood pressure is rising. Look at verse 5. Then the king Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is he? Who has dared to do this? And Esther said, A foe and an enemy, the wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. The king is offended that someone would seek to hurt the queen. That edict of death that, that he signed on a little while ago, it had so little impact on the king, he doesn't even recall. It wasn't that long ago that it was signed and put into place. When she mentions it to him, he's like, what is this? Who are we talking about? Who wants to do this? This is ridiculous. He has no memory of it. Where is this man? Who is he? Who dares? And this is the moment that Esther and Mordecai and the Jews have prayed for. Who is he? He's a foe, an enemy. It's Haman. We're told that in the moment that Haman was terrified, and this is the kind of fear, if you've ever had it, that freezes you. Like you can't move. Just there's nothing you can do. Unable to move, shocked into silence. Not only is his plan to kill Mordecai and destroy the Jews going to fail, he's pretty sure now he's going to die. And there's nothing he can do. And in a day, everything switched. In a matter of a day, the tables are completely turned. He's been completely outmaneuvered by a woman who was supposed to do everything that her husband told her to do. Like we even made an edict about it. It's all happening so fast, spiraling out of his control. Yesterday he was on top of the world. Look at verse 7. And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther. For he saw that harm was determined against him. By the king. So King Xerxes is enraged. He rises up and, uh, from the feast and he heads out to the palace garden. This is a major dilemma for the king because he must protect the honor of his queen, which is now publicly being threatened. But how does he punish Haman for something he signed off on? Without looking foolish, without looking like, you know, insecure, without looking like he has no idea what he's doing. How does the king save face in front of the people of the Persian Empire? And how does he reverse an irreversible law? So he's out in the garden just fuming and walking and thinking, what am I going to do? Meanwhile, Haman realizes that his last chance. His last opportunity at life is to plead with Esther. It's his only chance. She has all the cards. She has the king's ear. So Haman does what any person would do in that situation. He begs for his life, falling on the ground and on her couch next to her, begging for his life. Please save me. Look at verse 8. The king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, will he even assault the queen in my presence, in my own house? Nothing that Haman does is right. Like he's assaulting my bride. As the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. So Haman is pleading for his life. And this has caused him to commit another great insult in Persia. When the king returns from the garden, he finds that Haman has fallen on the couch at his wife, you know, begging for his life. We know from ancient history that in Persia, a man was not allowed to approach a woman of the king's harem. He was not allowed to be within seven steps. And here's Haman on the couch, probably hanging on her, begging for his life. Haman has thrown himself on the couch asking for mercy. It's almost certain that the king does not believe that Esther is being assaulted. Most likely, this is the exact answer that he's looking for. Does he think that she's being threatened by Haman and, and sexually assaulted? No. But he can sidestep the issue of the edict altogether and instead put Haman to death for attempted assault on the queen. I want to stop for a moment too here and address something that is somewhat controversial when you read like theologians in the book of Esther. Okay? Some writers consider this a failure on Esther's part that she does not show mercy to Haman 
and beg for his life. It's not very merciful, and it's not very ladylike. And, and that's one of the, the, the ideas you arrive at if you think that Esther's just about like how to be this really nice lady and sip tea and crumpets, okay? But that, in my opinion, okay, in understanding the text here, that's a total misunderstanding of this. I, you know that we have called out Esther's failures, her sins from early on in the book. I think the criticism, though, for lack of pity and mercy is misguided here. Well, why do you think that? Esther is queen of the greatest empire in the world. She is not a trophy wife. She's not a wallflower. She's not a vigilante, right? Especially not anymore is she a wallflower. The Bible has always given government to bear the sword, has always given government the right to protect its people through justly carrying out judgments, okay? It's always done that. Most opposition to the modern death penalty is about an unjust system. How that if you have money, you almost certainly can avoid the death penalty at all costs, right? But there's no question about injustice here. Haman did this. His name was all over it. His desire was to turn the empire of Persia against itself. His desire was to wipe out an entire people. He has shown that his power can't be trusted. What kind of a man hurts somebody so much right, or hates somebody so badly that he decides to wipe out the entire race associated with that man. Haman has committed acts worthy of death. Esther is not a vigilante. She is queen who is protecting her people, all of them, from pure evil. And she should be commended, okay? Again, that's free, okay? All right, look at verse 9. Last thing, and then we're going to jump into application. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs, in attendance on the king, said, Moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house, 50 cubits high. And the king said, hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. And the wrath of the king was abated. One last bit of irony and dark humor before the chapter is finished. Because, like, can it really get worse for Haman? Right, like that, it just so happens that the queen is a Jew, and, and then in begging for his life, he violates one of the great faux pas in the king's court. He's hanging on the wife and laying down beside her. Can it really get worse? The king returns in a rage to find Haman lying on this couch, and as he's in this rage, one of the eunuchs leans over and says, you know, Haman just happens to be building a gallows at his own house that he was going to use for Mordecai, 75 feet high of all things. It's just done, man. Poor Haman, he just knows, he knows it's over. What a turn of events. So Haman is impaled on the stake in front of his house that was meant for Mordecai. What do we make of this? What do we make of all the story of Esther up to this point? Let me, let me give you two things to think about today, okay? The first one is this. From Haman's life, be careful what you worship. Listen, Haman is a warning for every one of us, right? Haman's idols destroyed him. Well, Jason, what do you mean idols? I don't see any figures. I don't see them bowing down to anything of gold or brass. I don't see any talk of any idols. Haman's idols that I'm speaking of were idols of the heart. One of his idols, obviously from the text, is public recognition. So that when he's recognized like he thought he should be as second in command of all of Persia, life was good for Haman. It couldn't get any better. His heart was full. He was happy. But even though the entire country was bowing at his presence and kneeling, the refusal of one single person to kneel ruined his life. The refusal of one person to kneel and to give him what he thought was the credit due him sent him spiraling. Mordecai's disobedience had no bearing on Haman's power. It had no bearing on his status or his standing, but it ruined his life. He couldn't let it go. In all of the empire, only the king had more power. But that wasn't enough for Haman. He wanted it all. And listen to me, that is the thing about our idols. They promise satisfaction. But at the end of the day, it's never enough. If you had told Haman years earlier that he would become second in command and asked him, would this satisfy you? He would have said a resounding yes. If you give me that, I can't even imagine. I would want nothing. But then he's second in command, and his idol wants more. It demands more. 
there's one person in all of the kingdom who does not honor me. Be careful what you worship. The thing about idols is they promise satisfaction, but at the end of the day, it's never enough. And we know this. We experience it. At the end of a long week and a long day, the bottle looks good. It's going to chase some of those problems away. But at the end of the night, the bottle is empty and the pain is still there. And the problems are still there. Our idols, they always want more money, more effort, more lust, more glory. Our idols are always consuming, never satisfied. Be careful what you worship. Idols promise satisfaction. They promise fulfillment, but they deliver the emptiness that we see in Haman's life. Listen to me. God is not against pleasure. Okay, And when we talk about idols and we talk about, you know, things that we refrain from, we must understand the positive side of that, that God is not against pleasure. God is the one who gave laughter. I was reading a a famous writer earlier. He was like, like, the kind of laughter and joy that God brings, like, he created puppies. Do you know, seriously, he created, like, otters and how much fun they are. Like, he created kittens. God did that. He's not against laughter. He's not against pleasure. He created and gave sex in marriage. That's his idea. He gives satisfaction with the good day's work. That's God. That's what he does. God gives those things. We are celebrating rightly when we thank him for those good things. We should taste and drink and thank him for all of that. Well, how do I know something good has become an idol? Well, one of the, one of the ways we can kind of kind of self-diagnose is, well, how do you respond when that good thing's taken away? How do you respond when it's taken away, even if it's taken away for a season? Because if it elicits in you anger and outrage out of proportion, like it did for Haman, it's probably a good sign that now it's something that you worship. So maybe that's a job that initially was a good thing, but now it's different. Maybe it's respect. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a sport. How do you react when it's removed for a time? Man, I tell you what, in in my own life, right? And I think we can say that, but all of us that during the middle of all this quarantine, that that, that, that's one of the things God's doing, right? He's removing a lot of the things that we thought were just good. And maybe the pull of those things were stronger than we thought, right? The Bible but does not condemn laughter, condemn pleasure, condemn, condemn things like enjoying architecture or music or education or sports. It's only when all of those things are used for the true and living God, only when they're enjoyed as gifts from God, that they're truly enjoyed as God intends them to be. It's then when they have meaning, but because of the, the, what the Bible warns about that's in us, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, we tend to worship those gifts instead of the giver of those gifts. Our eyes are off the giver and our eyes are on the gifts. We tend to live as if those gifts are all there is. But that's what they are. They're simply gifts. They're simply tastes. They're giving us a glimpse of what's coming on the new heaven and the new earth. They're meant to encourage us along the way. They're meant to help us keep running, keep fighting the good fight, help us to keep telling others of what's coming and urging them to come with us. What are you craving deep down? Right? What are you craving deep down? I think one of the things we understand, that one of, one of, whether, whatever we're chasing, if we get to the heart of it, there is something in us that desires the eternal, that desires the permanent. You were made with eternity in mind. And genuine satisfaction can only come from God himself through his son Jesus. This is not all there is. And we we should probably say that to ourselves like every day. This is not all there is. When you do experience good pleasure, when you do experience the good gifts of God, receive it as a gift from God. I've talked about this before. This is the point of like praying before a great meal. That's the point. It's not somehow that like, uh, you know, bless this plate of trans fat, right? Like, uh, or Lord, bless this giant plate of carbs and still help help me get into keto, right? Like, uh, Like, that's not how that works. Like, it's just... Thank you. Man, this food is good. Man, this time with family and friends, thank you. God is a God of pleasure. So laughter in this way is a pleasure. Building in this way is a pleasure, right? Achieving excellence in a sport in this way, knowing that it's a gift 
is a pleasure. You can enjoy the sun. You can recharge at the beach. You can put those hands in the soil and plant and have zucchini for days, right? You can have sweet tea and Texas sunsets, okay? Uh, all of it. God, thank you. But be careful what you worship or your life will come to ruin like Haman. Here's the second thing and we're done. I think one of the things that we take away from Esther and the story of Esther is, is to trust God with our ordinary. So one of the themes of Esther is how God works through this ordinary providence, right? At this point in Israel's history, the promises of God appear to be a lie. God is silent. And if God is silent, then he must not care. And, and maybe he can't even stop the Persians. Maybe their gods are better than him. And look how successful the Persian army is. And, and maybe Xerxes is a god. And, and so what's God's answer for the empire, right? And is it plagues like before? Is it a massive army led by David like before? Is it fire and brimstone like Sodom and Gomorrah? And what's God ans God's answer is Esther. Like unfaithful, right? Just kind of redneck Esther. A Jew when it benefits her and a Persian when it doesn't. That's it. No fire from heaven, no mighty men, no band of mighty men, no ark of the covenant, no archangels, little old Esther. That's it. And so what we understand is that many, many times God saves, God preserves, God restores, God builds his church. He advances his kingdom through very ordinary people and very ordinary acts. And that's really good news for us because we're a bunch of ordinary people right here. That's all we are. Many, many times God builds his church and he builds his kingdom, not through miracles, but through ordinary events, through the ordinary, regular gathering together of a people called out to his name. Events that we would never consider significant in the moment. And maybe only years later might see it. Maybe you're looking right now at global events, and I know we all are, or even personal events. And you just don't see what God's doing. I, I get you. I I'm there with you. And you want action now. And maybe you want all your questions answered now. But many times with God, the answer is wait. Wait in faith. Just keep being obedient Trust the ordinary providence of God. Trust God with your ordinary. What can you do in the middle with all the concerns that you have about family and about jobs and about church? Just keep doing the obedient, faithful thing. Keep loving your kids, leading your family. Keep, keep being in the Word and trust God with ordinary, everyday decisions. Keep talking to your neighbor who has no chance of ever loving Jesus. This church has multiple people who had no chance of ever loving Jesus, and today they love Jesus. Do great miracles? No. Often do just other people praying relentlessly, just asking God to intervene. Don't buy the myth that the only way you can have an impact is if you make it big. God, okay, and especially when it comes to like, let's talk about it for churches. We're, we're a little church. What can we do in a global pandemic? And we sit in the shadow of such great big churches, right? Like, trust God with your ordinary, Dove Church. That's what you do. God loves to work with the pennies that widows give. He loves to work with the loaves and the fishes that the little boy gives. He loves taking faith of the grain of a mustard seed. It's really, really tempting in the middle of a great global pandemic to retreat in fear. What could we possibly do? What we can do is remember we're a chosen people, a royal priesthood. God promised to build his church, and he promised that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. So give your two fishes, or your two cents, your five loaves and two fishes. Watch God work. God works in ordinary ways, through ordinary means. Sometimes the change comes instantly, and a big show of power, and other times it comes decades, right? Years and years, hundreds of prayers, right? But God loves using little old Esther's and Mordecai's. Trust God with your ordinary. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, we come to you today, Lord, as very ordinary people. We come to you today, Lord, confessing that we struggle to trust you with that, that the temptation is just be like, what good is it? And so we'll just bury my talents, and I'll, I'll just bury what I have to offer because it's not enough. Lord, give us grace to trust you with it. Give us grace to be obedient. Lord, we confess, Lord, our, our hearts that take the good things you give and 
As we worship those gifts, we want to confess that as sin today. We turn to you for forgiveness of that. The instruments are going to play, and here's your time to speak with God. Maybe you're here, and you're not a Christian. Today, your prayer is, Father, save me. Be merciful to me, a sinner. Lay everything that you worship, all your false idols, your false gods, lay it at the cross, and receive salvation from the one true God through his son, Jesus. Maybe you're here, Christian, and God's revealing to you maybe something that you didn't think was an idol, but through the Spirit, he's showing you that it is. So confess it today. You are a fully loved and accepted child of God. You can be honest with him. Maybe you're here and you're struggling to trust God with your ordinary. So confess that struggle. Pray for grace and strength to lean into the fight. As the instruments play, here's your time to speak with God.